Hi everybody, my name is Daryl One and I'm the music director of the Victoria Symphony Orchestra here to bring you another video preview, this time for our last concert of the season featured on April 27th at the Victoria Fine Arts Center. It's our last one and uh, it's one of my favorite concerts of all time, I think, because I just love all the composers that are on it. And I believe most of you will be pretty familiar with a couple of them yourselves. But let's first start out with the very first one uh, that you probably don't know. Now, uh, let me tell you a little bit of a behind the scenes story about this particular program. Uh, there was a particular set of repertoire that we decided to use. Um, and I believe in some of our earlier promotional materials we had it, but uh, there were some issues that came up and so we made some changes. Now the first one is that the very first piece I was going to play an overture um, by an American composer named David Diamond and it was uh, called uh, Overture to Romeo and Juliet, incidental music. But it was only th about three minutes long, but it was included in this huge uh, suite about almost 20 minutes. And we only wanted that little three minute snippet, but we had to uh, rent the whole 20 minutes. So it, it seemed like a waste to have all that music that we weren't using. So I, was, I looked for something else that I thought could replace it. And what I always look forward to uh, programming and I, what I like to do in most concerts is to start out with something uh, flashy and bright and sparkling. And that's why I decided to choose this overture that doesn't get played too often, and I don't know why. It's written by a French composer named Jacques Hibert, and it's called Homage à Mozart. So it's an homage to Mozart. And it was written for the 200th anniversary of Mozart's birth. And it was written in the style of Mozart, even though Jacques Hibert was a 20th century composer. Now this particular piece, uh, the Homage à Mozart, was written in 1956. And he used the same size orchestra that Mozart used. And I'll play you a little bit of the beginning, and you can hear why it's like Mozart. It's a smaller orchestra, a lot of moving 16s, a lot of very clear uh, harmonies. <laughs> a lot of moving violins, very tonal, meaning staying in one key. But kind of fun. Just small use of the woodwinds. pieces and has a nice bright and sparkling ending to it. This is the homage a Mozart by Jacques Hibert. After the overture we'll be changing the stage setup and bringing out the piano. As you know the last concert of the last uh, three seasons have featured a winner from the Van Cliburn Piano Competition. And this year is no different. We are on the fourth of five pianists that we'll be hearing. Uh, these five pianists were very generously uh, sponsored by James and Tina Wayne. And so the, in this project that we call the Cliburn Project, we are featuring some of the great piano concertos with a uh, couple with the Van Cliburn winners. Uh, from the competition that, as you know, happens in Fort Worth. So this year we have an American pianist who happens to also have been a student at the Moore's School of Music at the University of Houston. His name is Kenny Broberg, and I'll let him tell you a little bit about himself, and you'll see in a little video that we have uh, for you. But I just wanted to tell you a little bit of the genesis of the program of that too, because like the first piece, uh, we had a few changes. At first, uh, I had asked uh, Kenny Broberg if he would play the Beethoven Fifth Piano Concerto, The Emperor, in E-flat. Uh, probably the most popular of the five piano concertos that Beethoven wrote. And I thought that would be a great piece to play. 
Um, and when we went back and forth with him and his management, he asked if he could play the Prokofiev Third Piano Concerto, which is a great piece and very wonderful, uh, wonderfully written, um, and a very popular concerto as well. But uh, I thought about it and thought, well, we could probably make the change if he wanted to. It fit timing and instrumentation, etc. Not too big of an orchestra. So we decided to change it. So we changed it to that. And then, uh, now, uh, just so you know, all these uh, artists that we usually engage are done at least a year, sometimes even more, before we actually have them. And so in this ensuing year, in the middle, uh, Kenny Broberg's management got in touch with us and asked if he could change the Prokofiev. That's already been changed from the Beethoven, the Prokofiev. And uh, we said, well, what's going on? He says, well, Kenny's going to be um, preparing for the Tchaikovsky competition. And uh, as such, he'll be working on a lot of the Russian concertos. And he was wondering maybe he could change it to that. And I said, well, like what? And they said, well, like the Rachmaninoff second, uh, which we did with one of the Van Clyburn winners, so we couldn't do that. And uh, there's the um, Tchaikovsky concerto, which we did with one of the past uh, winners in our Clyburn project. And as they went down through the list, it turns out that we'd done all of them. So I had returned back and said, well, we won't be able to do that, but what would you think of returning to the original one, the Beethoven Piano Concerto Number no. 5, The Emperor? And so we let them think about that, and they came back and said, okay, we'll do that. So round robin, here we are. We are back with the Beethoven Piano Concerto Number no. 5, uh, as we originally programmed. And you all probably know this from its heroic opening, which I will play for you a little bit. Now that's just the opening of the first movement. And the first movement is the longest of all the movements. I think that actually the first movement is longer than the second and the third combined. So uh, it you, makes the use of this E flat major theme and just builds it. And there's a lot of opportunity for the pianist to do lots of fun things. The second movement is a little slower and very poignant sounding. Beautiful. Very slow with strings. It's very tranquil and very serene. In the key of B major, and the first movement is an E flat, so it's an odd relationship between the keys. But Beethoven was one of the pioneers of breaking the norms of musical composition at this time. Now when the piano comes in, there's some very beautiful writing for the piano. Let's get to it. It's the strings with a beautiful pad of, or the piano with a beautiful pad of strings. Anyway, a beautiful second movement, and then to the return, the end of the last movement. Third movement. Very high energy. Playful. Anyway, beautiful concerto. Uh, as I said, the most popular of the Beethoven Five concertos, and certainly ranked in the top ten of all piano concertos of all time. Uh, I did tell you that uh, I have a little video of Kitty Broberg and he'd like to dress you a little bit about um, when he was preparing for the Van Clyburn competition. Sometimes performing for a big audience is 
more relaxing in a way than performing for a smaller audience because instead of individual people, everything kind of blends in. Basically just a lot of practice, a lot of strengthening yourself uh, mentally and physically. Uh, uh, strengthening your fingers so that you can project on a big stage uh, and mentally really getting focused and in the zone so that nothing can distract you. I went off with the last note and I went backwards and the concert master went forwards with his bow and I knocked the bow out of his hand. It went flying by the conductor. <laughs> I'm lucky I didn't have to buy him a new one. I, I listen to jazz. I love jazz. I tried to play jazz. I'm terrible at it. I hope that everyone uh, who's watching the broadcast will enjoy the music, the wide range of repertoire that everybody is playing, and uh, enjoy watching the process of uh, picking the next winner of the Clyburn. And now we come to the last piece on this program, and probably one of the, my favorite symphonies of all time to listen to and even to conduct, and that's the Brahms Symphony No. 2 in D major. Uh, not much of an interesting title. Uh, his symphonies were just Symphony No. 1, 2, 3, and 4. He wrote four uh, symphonies. But Brahms was a man that was ahead of his time in many ways. Uh, he looked to the future and he looked to the past. And what I mean by that is that when he looked to the past, his orchestras were smaller, classical sized, even though he was a romantic composer. Uh, so while his contemporaries were writing for huge orchestras with triple winds and, and uh, six horns and four trumpets and trombones and batteries of percussion, Brahms stuck to a classical orchestra of just double winds and just four horns and maybe two trumpets and sometimes trombones in some of his movements timpani and very, very, very little percussion in his symphonies um, in the normal string section. So he kept to the classical ideal and the form of each of these movements were strictly classical forms. Sonata, allegro form, uh, song and accompaniment form. These were all forms that Beethoven, Mozart, Haydn used and while his contemporaries were stretching the boundaries of form, Brahms stayed within that. He loved the classical ideal and he stayed with it. Uh, that's why, for example, in his scores you'll find the horns were written in different keys. Horns for horns in C, horns in H, which was uh, German for the key of B, uh, horns in E flat, etc. Even though the chromatic horn was available at that time and other composers were using it, the horn that could play in all keys. Uh, but he wrote in for horns in specific keys. So everything was very classical in that way. So he was very much in the past that way. But forward was a different thing. His use of harmonies were adventuresome, uh, some as adventurous as his uh, romantic contemporaries using big orchestras. But where Brahms excelled above everyone else was in rhythm. It's hard to point it out by listening to the music You'd have to look at the music and look at the score. But often, the, the bar lines where if you're in 3-4 time and there's three beats in a bar line, three beats in a bar line, you listen to the music and it's as if he moved the bar line over a beat or forward a beat. So in a lot of his music, it's very disconcerting for the musicians because you see on the page and you see where the downbeats are and you feel where the the harmonic rhythm of the downbeats are, but the rhythm is not in the right spot. It almost feels like it's in the wrong place where you would naturally feel it. But he would stretch that in all kinds of places. And I would say there's not a, a piece of Brahms that I know of that he doesn't do that several times within the piece. And he just had this feeling that was different. Um, uh, if, for example, in his violin concerto, which was in the first movement is in three, four time, he writes these little figures that are clearly in 5-4 time, even though he wrote it in 3-4 time. So it would be 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, that's 5, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, another 5. 
So it would sound like that, like it was in five, even though it was written with only three beats and three beats and three beats. So he really made it unusual and different. But it gave it a kind of uh, rhythmic freedom that you didn't feel any place else. It would seem more expansive when he would do this sort of thing. Or it would feel like there was a, a, a different step that was put into it. And you, you, you could feel it in the music. So anytime you listen to Brahms, if you hear some places where things seem to feel like they're moving slower or they're or they're, they're moving faster or all of a sudden like you're in a place where you thought you were not supposed to get there yet, you got there quicker. And that's because of Brahms' complex and advanced use of rhythm. Uh, he did this in the Romantic period and there's no other composer that could do that uh, before that and since then. He's unique in his use of being able to change rhythm within a very classical and very simple uh, format. Uh, many composers in the 20th century have done a lot more with rhythm, but in a way that's very obvious. His was not obvious at all. You don't, didn't know what was happening until it happened. But anyway, that's Brahms. But let me play you a little bit of the, the first movement of his symphony in number two. He loved the horns. This symphony is sometimes known as his happy symphony. You can kind of tell. This movement is very serene. And beautiful and floating. And later on, it gets to be get a little bit more movement to it. This is the famous second movement, uh, second theme in the first movement. Now that's melody, Brahms melody. Now that's Brahms. Now, in the second movement, we get some of that rhythmic displacement. It sounds like this. One, two, three, four. But it's not that. It's actually four. One, two, three, four. One, two, it seems off. Then four. Now we're on the. Now we're, it sounds right. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That's a small example of that rhythmic displacement. His third movement is very gracious. It says grazioso, light. And in this movement, Brahms takes this theme and plays it in different forms. It's almost like a variation of these, of these particular melodies. It keeps changing them. Now the last movement sounds. It starts very soft. All strings and now a few winds. And as Brahms likes to do, softer until he surprises you with a the theme, loud. Energetic, 
very joyful. It seems joyful, doesn't it? And the ending. Let's move ahead. Now here is this is the last minute or so of the piece, and he moves through all kinds of different chords outside of the key of this last move. The symphony is in D major, and it ends in D major, but he's passing through all kinds of keys through this ending, building the energy. Brahms Second Symphony, and you will hear it in all its glory after one of the most popular piano concertos of all time, the Beethoven Emperor Concerto, preceded by a bright and sparkling and fun overture that is modeled after the great master Mozart by Jacques Ibert, the homage on Mozart. So I hope you'll come out and hear this last concert of the season. Um, I'm very excited about it. Very excited about having Kenny with us to play, and I hope to see you in the concert hall. Thanks for listening.